Good evening. We will start tonight with a work session on our insurance plan changes. Mr. Supple. Thank you, Mr. Lang. Uh, Vicki, if you'd pull up the PowerPoint, please. I'd first like to uh, uh, thank our members of the Employee Insurance Committee. The next slide shows the members. I would especially uh, note this year that we were uh, lucky to have Janet Stiglitz as a board member who served on the committee with us for this year. So uh, that was nice. Uh, the other members are fairly typical representatives, one from each of the uh, employee groups. Uh, we have a at-large, a member at-large, as well as uh, a member, a, a, re a representative of retirees. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so tonight I'd just like to talk a little bit about the process that we use, and after I have that introduction, we'll talk about our dental renewals, uh, and then our medical third-party administrator and network, and then the plan changes that we're recommending uh, for our medical plan. Next slide, please, next slide, please. Uh, so every year there are some uh, aspect of our insurance coverages that are uh, out for bid. So we try not to have everything happen in one year, so they're staggered over the course of uh, three or four years. And so we first determine which of the coverages are due for renewal, uh, and then uh, we take a look if there's anything that uh, any uh, line of coverage that we're having difficulty with where we may want to do something different, uh, and we may add that to the list. After we've determined which pieces are going to be rebid, we work with our insurance consultant. Uh, they prepare those documents for us. Uh, they also survey the market and then send those uh, documents out to the market. And then after the responses to our requests are received, we analyze those internally between Aaron Murray, our benefits manager, myself, and our insurance consultant. And then we have an opportunity with our insurance committee members to share those results uh, and talk about our findings. We use that conversation then to develop our recommendations for the Board of Education. It's important to note that our conversation is guided by the fact that we have a policy that spells out what we need to do relative to our insurance benefits uh, and our premium structure. So our current policy uh, indicates that we need to have a plan offering so that an individual employee uh, can choose to elect the base medical, the low or lowest cost dental plan, and the vision coverage, and that the combination of those premiums um, needs to be at least equal to the board contribution so that that employee doesn't have any out-of-pocket expense uh, for individual only coverage. So they can get medical, dental, and vision coverage, individual only, no out-of-pocket expense. So it's within that framework that we uh, develop our premium structure. Next slide, please. Also, uh, we take a look at the reserve accounts uh, and determine what the, the gap may be there. We have both medical and dental self-funded plans, so those are important considerations for us. Uh, that helps us determine how much funding is necessary so that we can maintain an appropriate level of reserves. And then if there is a gap between what the premium structure would bring in and what our reserve requirement is, we have conversation around what plan changes we may need to make, uh, what type of uh, increase in our premium structure may be required, and what change in board contribution uh, may be necessary. Uh, and after those conversations, we develop our recommendations for the board, and that's what will be reflected tonight. So on our dental plans, we have several. Next slide, please. Uh, we have our uh, dental PPO plan, which is a self-funded plan. We also offer a, a program through Family Dental. Uh, that plan is renegotiated each year. And then this year, the dental HMO plan, which is currently provided to us by Cigna, was the piece of our coverage that was due for bid, uh, and so that was bid out this year. Uh, the, for, for that dental HMO, we marketed to seven carriers, including our incumbent. All of the 
people except our incumbent declined to provide us a quote. And as we got those uh, responses back, they told us that uh, many carriers are no longer offering a dental HMO. Uh, they find that the enrollments are declining, uh, which causes the rates to be very high, so they're uh, not very competitive, and it makes it very difficult for them to guarantee any uh, future year rates. Um, they also indicated that they would be interested in a larger segment of our population than just the individuals who are in the dental HMO. So they thought it was a fairly small a slice of the overall pie. Next slide, please. And so uh, we did get a return uh, from Cigna, and uh, they did offer us uh, essentially uh, the, the very same rates as we have this year, which is uh, uh, an improvement because they also bid on our medical plan, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And so they initially proposed a small rate increase, but as because we would potentially bundle uh, dental and medical through the same provider, they said if, if you go with our medical plan, we'll not have any increase. So that's about a $4,700 in savings. And they also offered a buy-up plan uh, with some very attractive rates. So it offers us program of coverage that's very similar to the benefits available through Family Dental, which is one of our more expensive dental programs. Uh, but the premiums under the Cigna plan would be lower than Family Dental, and they also have a wider uh, network. Uh, they essentially use the same network as the Cigna uh, Dental HMO. They also provided us a three-year rate guarantee uh, for that uh, dental HMO buyout. And the other advantage to us is that uh, we do not have to uh, segregate um, it between family, we don't have to not offer family dental. So we can continue to offer family dental as well as a dental HMO buyout plan through Cigna. And we thought that at least in this first year for 1920 plan year, we would give people the opportunity to vote with their pocketbook. So if they take a look at the structure of benefits and decide that uh, the Cigna plan is better for them, uh, we may find um, that there would be fewer people enrolled in Family Dental. It may also give us some leverage with Family Dental in the future to uh, have them provide us with more than a single year uh, bid proposal. So uh, then, then we did, th that is a good transition to Family Dental. They are a, a unique provider, kind of a single source provider. They only give us a one year bid at a time. Uh, and this year, uh, that is a 3.5% premium increase, but there are no changes uh, in any of the coverages. And so the slide there just shows what the rates would be uh, for each of those levels of coverage. The big work this year was really our medical uh, plan. Our, we have a third party administrator who processes all of the claims for us for our self-funded program. And we also bid out our network of hospitals and doctors. Um, next slide, please. And so we did market that to five different carriers. Uh, UMR is our incumbent. And of course, we included them in, in that process. There were two additional firms besides the five that we uh, specifically reached out to who were interested in and requested the request for proposal. We did receive responses from five companies. You can see them uh, listed up there. Next slide, please. When we're taking a look at the uh, plan and their structure, we make a big focus on member services. We want to make sure that they're providing appropriate support to our members. Uh, we're interested in how they communicate with employees. Uh, uh, insurance coverage can sometimes be very confusing. We want to make sure they have a robust uh, uh, call center and that it's staffed appropriately so that our members can, be, uh, can get their questions answered in a timely way. Uh, we look at their account management, how many, how many accounts would the people be responsible for who are working with us. We don't want them to be so overburdened with accounts that they uh, can't pay attention to us. Uh, the reporting is very important. We meet on a quarterly basis with all of our plan providers. We need to know what's happening with our medical plan, and so the, uh, the reports that are available are very important. Uh, we do look at financial considerations. Uh, what type of network do they have? What type of disruption might there be? Um, 
what type of pharmacy benefit might be uh, offered and, and what type of uh, disruption. And then there are various miscellaneous factors. Next slide, please. Uh, our consultant then uh, weighted each of those factors. Uh, they assigned a score of one to five to each of the categories, and then we used that weighted score to really analyze which of the vendors uh, we wanted to uh, look at uh, in more depth. Uh, we also take into consideration uh, subjective considerations and, and references. Uh, you know, we have a history with UMR, and so it certainly is a subjective consideration that uh, the ease of remaining with the current carrier would be, that would be an example of what we're talking about. Uh, this slide shows what the rated scores are. You can see that our current uh, provider, UMR, uh, was second highest with a score of 4.01, uh, and Cigna came in with the highest score of 4.10. Uh, they are uh, used by Rockwood School District, have been used at, by Rockwood for a number of years, also at, at Melville School District and uh, Fontbonne University. Next slide, please. And so this is a comparison of the bids. Uh, you can see that the far left column of numbers is our current uh, structure, and then the next, the middle column is UMR's uh, proposal uh, as part of the rebid process and then Cigna's proposal uh, related to that as well. Uh, back, please. Thank you. Uh, so you, the big difference here is that we have some additional savings that come as a result of switching to, uh, potentially switching to a different network, the, the Cigna network. You can see almost $200,000 uh, worth of savings there. And so when you get down to the bottom line, uh, it looks like the, the, there's about a $600,000 difference in total uh, uh, savings with Cigna as opposed to uh, our current UMR plan, uh, and uh, even a little bit, about $500,000 with UMR's rebid. Uh, we did take a look at how much disruption there would be. That means how many people who are currently um, seeing certain doctors may not they may not be in the Cigna network. Uh, it's a relatively small number, about 2%, um, but there would be some uh, disruption from our uh, current uh, structure. Next slide, please. So uh, after a lot of consideration and discussion with the group, we decided to transition from UMR to Cigna. Uh, we would recognize net savings in the first year of $268,000. Uh, we know that Cigna has a very strong care management program, and we really think there'll be relatively minimal member disruption. Uh, one of the important things in considering the disruption factor is that that can vary year to year. So that's based on if you took everybody who's in the plan this year, who went to certain doctors this year, and you applied Cigna's network, that's how they calculate the disruption, and next year it may be uh, the disruption could be less or greater depending upon who's in the plan and what doctors they see. So it's a it's a constant it's a it's a estimation of what the disruption would be, uh, but the two percent would indicate it's going to be pretty small. Next slide. All right. So uh, Terrell then uh, helps us taking a look at what the funding would be. Uh, we do evaluate our plan performance on a year-to-date basis. We are. Uh, using numbers from April of 2019 to establish premiums for a plan year that begins in October of 2019 and runs through September of 2020. So there's about an 18-month lag across that whole period. So uh, we're very fortunate. J.W. Terrell has a very talented uh, actuary uh, uh, who works with us to uh, help develop those projections. Uh, and, and so we do project what our future claims and expenses are going to be. Uh, we look at then what rate changes or changes in benefits might be necessary and uh, how we might uh, keep our program reserve at the correct level. This is just a history of our self-funded reserve account. Uh, you can see that we're doing uh, a lot better. We've, we've made some strides in, in getting that to an appropriate place. Uh, we had an especially uh, robust set of rebates uh, this plan year to date. 
Uh, that really has to do with the fact that we had some very high dollar claims this year that were subject to uh, reimbursement through our stop loss insurance. Uh, but it does contribute to our funding reserve, so uh, being able to get the reimbursement for those claims was an uh, important part of the factor that led to the higher reserve amount for 2018. And we're projecting that at the end of 2019, at the end of this uh, year, uh, we will have $2.3 million uh, in reserves. So then we take a look at what is our projected reserve balance, uh, what is the funding that's necessary, and if you take the funding and, and the reserves, uh, where is that? So we, we take a look at 2018 and we compare that to 2000 plan year uh, 2019, and we show that the gap between those two um, is about $700,000. So that's, that's the gap that we're trying to fill. Next slide, please. This is just a, a synopsis of how we arrived at uh, where we are. Uh, so we know that the projected uh, gap is $700,000. So you can see that the net savings there is 268. Uh, the various savings items are listed out. And then there are, uh, because we're going to be switching third-party administrators, there are some claims that are currently being processed that haven't been completed yet. And so we have to pay UMR for a couple of months some administrative fees just to finish processing claims that are already in the works. So that's the runout fee of about $135,000. So that's a deduct from the other savings, but we have uh, about $268,000 in savings. Uh, the gap then becomes $431,000, uh, relatively small uh, uh, gap to close and a increase in our premium structure and board contribution of 2% uh, would equal the amount necessary to close that gap. Next slide. So if we take a look at our, just as just our medical premiums, where we are, this reflects a 2% increase uh, in our rates between uh, the current year, the plan year that we're in, and the plan year that will start in October of 2019. Next slide. Uh, same is true with our dental premiums, are broken out by plan, and you can see that we've titled the new dental HMO buy-up program as Cigna Dental Plus. So we'll now have Cigna Dental Standard and Cigna Dental Plus. And so that's why uh, there are no current rates for the Dental Plus program. It'll be a new offering uh, in 2019-20 plan year. And you can see that, you know, just a comparison between Family Dental and the Dental Plus, the, the, the premiums are significantly less. You know, $57 for Family Dental for an individual only versus $32 uh, for Cigna Dental Plus. And then our vision program, no changes in the uh, premiums or in the benefit offerings. Uh, so those are just the premiums for next year. So if we lay our uh, contributions side by side, we do offer our teachers who work a half-time schedule, have the opportunity to continue to participate in our insurance program, uh, but they only get half of the board contribution, so that's why that's broken out that way. And so uh, we take a look at uh, various categories, uh, individual only, individual and spouse, individual and children, individual and family. There are different uh, contribution levels uh, for each of those, different premium structures and different contribution levels for each of those, and for each of the separate plans, the high plan, the base plan, and the consumer-driven plan. And so this slide just is a comparison of those rates between last year and this year, uh, and both for the full and the half contribution from the board. We always provide some out-of-pocket examples. Uh, this can, shows you that with our consumer-driven plan, um, there are, of course, many permutations, uh, but these are the standard permutations that we look at every year. So with any of the uh, dental plans and um, the vision and uh, the CDH plan, there's no out-of-pocket uh, uh, for the individual only. And you can see that also for our base plan and 
Aetna and the, our vision plan, which would be the typical uh, one that meets our board policy. Uh, that is also zero out of pocket, as is the Cigna standard dental HMO, zero out of pocket for individual only. Uh, if they choose a family dental and the, and the base medical, uh, a very minimal out of pocket, um, 70 cents per month, the difference between last year and this year, uh, a total of a little over uh, $8 uh, for the year. And then the high plan is a more expensive medical plan. There is out of pocket expense for employees. Uh, you can see that's going up uh, in, in, you know, two to four dollars. And you can see what the uh, uh, total uh, annual cost of that would be for people. The next slide shows out-of-pocket examples for family enrollment. So again, there are individual and spouse, individual and children, individual and family. Uh, we don't show all those permutations, but this, we, we take the, the two ends of that spectrum, individual only, and then individual family. Uh, and we have some very attractive uh, rates for our uh, uh, plan members. So with our uh, CDH plan, uh, we have very affordable coverage. So uh, the out-of-pocket for employees, uh, depending upon their choice of dental program, uh, you know, and they don't have to take a dental program, but it ranges uh, in the $400 range uh, out-of-pocket. And so, uh, really pretty modest increases year over year uh, for our, cons uh, our consumer-driven plan. And if we, we're going to have another slide in just a moment, you can see that our, our out-of-pocket change is, uh, uh, the, the, the variation year to year is about half of what it has been previously. Again, the high plan is a more expensive plan, so a greater amount of out-of-pocket expense uh, related to that. So, you know, about $5 for uh, the consumer-driven plan, depending upon you know, what dental program you choose, closer to $22 to $25 for the high plan, uh, uh, additional per month, um, depending uh, if you would choose a high plan. So this is just a history of the out-of-pocket expense by month uh, if you choose a family coverage. And so you can see that in, uh, again, just taking that first line, the, the consumer-driven plan with Aetna, dental and our vision program, it was in, two years ago $13.64, this year $13.86, and this year $5.07. So uh, the increase amount is about half, of, again those are monthly uh, increases, and, and it's about half of what it has been uh, previously. So our recommendations are to uh, trans, uh, keep uh, Cigna Dental HMO. Uh, there's no increase in premiums and no changes to our benefits or co-pays. Uh, we are going to add the dental HMO buy-up option, which we will label as uh, Cigna Dental Plus. Uh, we recommend staying with Family Dental Services for the next year, uh, increase our premiums by 3.5%. Uh, no changes to the benefits or co-pays for family dental. On the medical plan, we recommend transitioning from URMR to Cigna for our third-party administrator and network. Uh, we have net savings of $268,000. Uh, we would increase our premiums by 2% with no changes to deductibles or co-pays and have a contribution rate increase by the district also equal to 2% for all plans at all levels. I mentioned early in the presentation that there are certain uh, coverages that are uh, bid on a cycle, but we always take a look each year if there's any uh, particular area where we're having difficulty uh, that we may want to bid something sooner than it's t traditionally scheduled. And that is the case with our life and disability program. Um, we are currently <coughs> out for bid for those services. Uh, Dearborn is our incumbent, uh, but one of the things that we've uh, struggled with with them is that they handle our short-term disability claims, uh, and that is a fairly common occurrence uh, during the course of the year for us, and we've had a substantial amount of difficulty with them processing those claims correctly, so it creates a tremendous amount of work uh, within our uh, insurance, uh, our, our benefits uh, department, 
and also for our employees. They're already out of work and uh, trying to get uh, uh, the, the short-term disability payments, which they need to, you know, to kind, kind of keep nor normalcy in their life, and then things get messed up, and what happens is they have to send the original, the, the, the first check they got was wrong, so they have to send it back, then a new check has to be issued. All of that is a time delay, and it's gotten to be a real problem. Uh, so we did decide to bid those out uh, that only just recently went out for bid because we had a lot of other things in the hopper this year with the medical and third party uh, administrator uh, being bid out. Uh, so we do intend, we're having a meeting with the insurance committee next week uh, to review the results of the RFP process and uh, we will hopefully be making a recommendation uh, relative to uh, our life and our disability program. One of the things that we asked for is uh, that they would also administer our Family and Medical Leave Act. Uh, that's something that currently is managed in-house, uh, but we know that the companies who provide these services also do, FMLA. And uh, with the onboarding of our transportation employees, uh, we anticipate that there could be an increase in the amount of FMLA claims that we'll be dealing with. And so being able to outsource some of that uh, could be very helpful to us uh, as we go forward. So. Uh, I don't have information to share with the board this evening, but uh, for June the 20th, as we bring back our other recommendations, uh, there will also likely be a recommendation for our life, disability, and FMLA uh, processing. I think that's it for me. I would be happy to answer questions from the board. Board, do we have any questions? Ms. Walker? Okay, so no out-of-pocket expenses. Is there a deductible on that plan? Yes, our plans have deductibles. Okay. We're to, when I mention no out-of-pocket, I'm saying in order to pay the premiums to access that plan, they don't have to pay out-of-pocket to meet the premiums. And then are we also paying the deductible for those that opt for the lower plan? The consumer-driven plan, we provide employees a contribution to their health savings account, uh, which they can use to offset uh, some of the claims that they incur, or they could choose to, because that money uh, uh, is tax-free uh, and, and accumulate the interest on it is tax-free, they can hold on to that and, and use it uh, for future medical expenses. Is that something that we negotiate with the employee groups? Or? Yes. Through the, through the Employee Insurance Committee. But not as part of our labor relations negotiations? No, the, the timing, uh, typically the timing of um, the decisions around insurance never ma mesh up with the timing for our employee negotiations. So in a, in a typical year, we would begin employee negotiations in the early part of the winter, and we really can't begin the rebid process or the premium setting process for insurance until April and May, because it's already an 18-month look-forward period, and you just we just can't get uh, reliable data for any longer period than that. So those tip, those those two things are typically out of sync. Um, so the, the the conversations about uh, how we approach those are typically done uh, through the Employee Insurance Committee. Is that how other school districts do it? I couldn't speak to how, every school, how other school districts do it. Okay, I, I'd be curious to see how other districts are handling that. Um, Shell, to answer your question, I do think there are some districts that negotiate insurance. But that's never been, we've never negotiated insurance here.
determination that the tax plan qualifies or not. And then they will, I'm a little, I'm sorry. So is your third party administrator making that determination about it? So the, 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 the application process and so forth will be monitored by district, but handled mainly by the third party. So we will have input into the decision. person that comes up with those scores just subjectively based on yeah so if we um, again it, it, if you if you think about the uh, categories that we're looking at uh, financial considerations will receive a heavier weighting uh, because it's, it's a pretty um, you know expensive part of what we do uh, so yes I you know uh, and then uh, communications might be a two, and the financial aspect would be a five. You wouldn't want to, um, a, a company that does a great job with reporting, but is very, very expensive, if you don't weight the factors the, the, that you're considering, you could end up uh, with one company looking like they're uh, much better than another, but they're the much more expensive company. Yeah, so our, our insurance consultant uh, prov uh, provides, in, in consultation with Mrs. Murray and myself, uh, provides the weighting structure that we use. Okay, so I guess my last question is, what do the numbers look like for Anthem and Maritane? We're seeing UMR and Cigna, but we're not seeing those other ones. Correct, they were much more expensive than the, the two bids that we shared the information with you. I had asked a couple of questions, and one of them was like, what is the cost per individual, individual and spouse, individual and family? And you provided us with data, and I'm assuming that if I take the total, like I'm looking at the base dent, base medical, medium dental and vision, um, for an individual with spouse, it's $1,326. The district contributes $882, and it's 400, so it'd be $444 a month. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so right. I, I, let me pull up that PowerPoint because I don't have it's it in on front of me right now. One. But there's, there's numbers that are in parentheses, so I'm assuming that's the monthly. That is monthly. Monthly cost in addition. Okay. Yes. And in looking at that, one of the other questions I was like, how much is the district providing and how much are the individuals providing? And if looking at these percentages are correct. Mrs. Friend, could you pull up the other PowerPoint, please? And if looking at those, it looks like the district's providing 100% um, of for individuals, which is per policy, and then the employee is providing roughly 35 to 37% of anything other than an individual. If, we're, if, if it's a spouse, if it's individual and children, or if it's individual and family, the employee is contributing 37%, and the district's picking up 63% or 65% of the cost. Sure. I'm assuming that is about right. It's uh, so it's uh, as many children as you may have. So the difference is family is your spouse and your children. So you can cover yourself, yourself and your spouse, yourself and only your children, or yourself, your spouse, and your children. And that's family. And so if we, uh, Mrs. Frain, if you could look at the slide that's employee contribution percentage. That's the title at the top. The last one. Right. So, uh, what, what I did here was just to take a look at um, the employee contribution percentage. So Mr. Hain explained it correctly. There's a, if you take the, the cost of 
the medical program that you select, the dental program that you select, and the vision program. Uh, it, the, that, that's the sum of that premium comes to some number, and then there's the board contribution that offsets it, and then there's typically some differential. Uh, so for it, just looking at this chart, the high plan, which is the more expensive, this happens to be, I chose a high plan, the middle dental plan, and, uh, and vision, of course, and then if you take a look at those numbers, for individual only coverage, the employee contributes about 26%, and so the board would pick up the difference. Uh, and then for, because it's a more expensive plan, uh, for the family levels of coverage, either spouse or children or family, it's m closer to 50%. So the employee, if they choose that set of combina that combination of, of coverages, they're paying about 50% of the cost, and the board contribution covers about 50% of the cost. So the next column down is just the base medical, the uh, uh, lower uh, cost medical plan. And so you can see for individual only, they have uh, only about 6% or, or, you know, in, in, in the up years we're looking at here, the more recent ones, only about 2%. So most of that is, but that's individual only coverage. Uh, and then for the spouse and, the, the, you know, the, the family coverage levels, it's m closer to the 40% range. So about a 60-40 split. And then for the consumer driven plan, which is the lowest cost medical program, for individual only coverage, there are some negative numbers there that's indicative of the fact that the board contribution, even with uh, vision and dental programs included, there's no out-of-pocket cost. So there's, a, there's some money left over. Now, that money doesn't get used by the employee, but the board contribution is more than sufficient to cover that cost. So there's no out-of-pocket uh, at the consumer-driven level. And then the uh, family level of coverages, again, those three tiers, are somewhere in the mid-20 range. So for the consumer-driven plan, uh, much less out-of-pocket, uh, a little bit more for the base plan, and it's about a 50-50 split for the uh, cons uh, uh, high plan. And then in the preceding slides, it shows you the calculation of the premium so you can get an idea of how we got to the numbers that are here. And then I just, again, the reason that I put it together this way is to show you that over time, with the various changes that we've made, the relative contributions of employees for the various tiers has stayed pretty consistent. So, um, you know, just picking one at random, uh, high, dent high medical, the medium dental, at family coverage, 53%, 53%, 52, 52, 52, 52, 52. 52. So we have been fairly consistent in keeping the split, if you will, consistent over time. And again, the same is, is true for the other plan levels as well. And, and then on the consumer-driven plan, the cost and the numbers are there. Does that include the 1,000 or the 2,000 per family? Is that in, are those numbers in these costs or is, those, are those separate? The, 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 the contribution to the health savings account is separate from the premiums. So it's, this is a, a cost for premiums, and it doesn't reflect the uh, contribution for the health savings account. Okay, so the actual district cost would be higher because we're contributing $1,000 for the individual and $2,000 for a Correct. spouse or kids or family. Correct. So those are, that actually would be a higher percentage. Offs offset by the fact that the, consumer, the structure of the consumer-driven program, uh, we, we uh, realize uh, less uh, plan expense as a result. So the contribution to the health savings account, we, we, we took what we might have otherwise paid in premium and gave it to the employees as an incentive to participate in a plan that's less expensive for the district overall. Right. Okay, and then I know that we do most of this stuff in reference to uh, policy, what is it, 45? 45, 40. 40, and that policy says that, we're, that the district will pay basic health, dental, and vision, and we'll cover that entire cost. Um, for the I individual think, only. Right, for an individual. 
I think we've kind of reached the point where administration or the board or the district needs to revisit that language or something along those lines because I'm not saying we get rid of coverage, I'm not saying we cut coverage, but I think something more in line with the district is now providing for an individual 600 and for next year we're proposing to provide $650. You know, I'm thinking something more in lines like the district will provide $650 toward insurance costs or something like that. And I think that some of the decisions that have been made in the past or some of the decisions that may be made in the future may be affected by the fact that this is tied to a dollar amount as opposed to a minimum of each. And I think that, I mean, I'd like to see administration possibly review that in, in policy or whatever. I don't know if the rest of the board is in favor of anything like that or how they feel, but um, sure. I think that a, a dollar amount or some variation thereof uh, would possibly promote yep. better decisions. And, and to make sure that we, uh, I, I, I want to be clear about this so that there isn't confusion for the board or for people in the audience. Uh, 4540 is part of what is covered uh, under our uh, agreement with our employee groups. And so in terms of our largest employee group, our teachers, uh, we can't open up negotiations on language for another year. Correct? Not this year. So we're done with this year and next year's salary only. So it's not until 21-22 that we can talk about language. So 4540 would be covered under that unless the two parties would mutually agree to open up for a language issue. So I just want to say there's not intransigence on the administration's part. Uh, there was an agreement five years ago that locked down Negotiation around language, 4540 is covered by that. Um, and so we've been operating under the existing board policy. And unless there was mutual agreement to open up the language, we wouldn't be able to unilaterally choose to do that. I believe I'm correct, Mrs. Simpson? I would agree. Okay, and then the other part of that is I know most companies, whether it be union, non union, public or private, have either a, I don't know how to phrase it, but it's either if you're a if you use healthy choices, they benefit you, or if you're using what would be considered unhealthy choices, and I'll just use the example of smoking, um, they have higher premiums for those individuals that choose to smoke um, as opposed to those that choose not to. Is that something that we have looked into or that we're reviewing, or I'm assuming that's something that we could implement as part of this ongoing thing? It seems like it's a very common practice everywhere. Uh, except for we're not using it, I think it'd be something that possibly we, we could look into. Is that something that we can do or? We have uh, had conversations at various times in the insurance committee about uh, how we could structure incentives for the program. Uh, there are some uh, uh, restrictions that come as a result of settled case law in terms of how you have to approach those. Uh, so. Uh, you know, by, by way of example, you have to be careful how you structure an incentive because you can't discriminate, discriminate against an employee who's obese because they don't have a certain BMI. And, and, and I'm not advocating those types I, I, of things. I'm just using... I'm just saying that's, that's right. part of the reason that we've moved slowly on it is that the way you have to structure the incentives. Um, but yeah, yes, we've had conversation and, and we can certainly... Uh, take a look at that. You know, our first foray into that, it doesn't appear that way maybe, but our first foray into that was our uh, employee clinic. Uh, it gives people an, uh, an incentive uh, through the structure, the, the copay structure. You know, it's, it's free to the base and high plan, a very low uh, copay for a consumer driven plan for people to see the doctor so that they're getting the appropriate care, the right care at the right time, which helps avoid costs in the future. Um, uh, other school districts, I know, uh, we do have a uh, opportunity for people to take a uh, personal health assessment uh, through our clinic, and other school districts provide some type of incentive for individuals who complete the personal health incentive. Personal health assessment, and that's the type of structure, uh, incentive that would work very well because it doesn't make any difference 
how old you are, how young you are, how heavy you are, how skinny you are, whether you smoke or not, if you complete the health assessment, we can provide uh, an incentive. And that could be incentivized through some uh, reduction in premium. Uh, I know other school districts have chosen to give uh, a monetary or a, um, a physical incentive like a Fitbit or something like that. But we could certainly approach it, um, encourage that type of behavior through some type of premium uh, incentive. Okay. I just know that most companies, a lot of other districts and everybody else is, you know, I, I know that the obvious one is smoking or non-smoking, it's pretty cut and dry, and they charge a higher premium for those smokers versus non-smokers. Um, now you can structure it either way, you know, and provide incentives and stuff. I understand there's uh, complications and issues with both, but I just want to make sure it's something that we're looking into because this is like our second highest expense other than salaries. So you know, different ways we can modify it or tweak it to uh, save money or, you know, provide savings to the district and the taxpayers, I think we should look into it. And we're not cutting, you know, the benefits to the individuals that are employees of the district too. Exactly. Sure. Thank you. Um, I don't have a question, I have a comment. Uh, first of all, thank you for asking me to serve on that insurance committee. I thought that it went very, very well. I want to publicly thank you, Mr. Seppel and Mrs. Murray, for all your hard work that you put into this. I know that it's not easy trying to come up with decisions, and everybody in that room worked really hard and really looked at what was the best benefit with the insurance, with the medical, and everything. So um, I just want to make sure that everybody knows how much work was really put into this and the discussions that were around it. So thank you again. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, Ms. Walker. I'd like to see what our benchmark districts, what do their insurance plans look like and what are the costs on those? Is that possible that you could get us that information before we vote on this? Um, it's, it's possible for us to collect data on premiums. It's very difficult to make a true apples to apples comparison because Copays, deductibles, the types of services covered differ plan to plan. So we have worked through our insurance consultant who works with a number of school districts. Uh, and, and, and just by way of example, Francis Howell uses a defined contribution methodology. Other school districts have a defined benefit. So they agree that they're going to pay for this plan, and whatever the cost of the plan is, that's what they get. So. Our methodology is different, our plan structure is different. We can certainly take a look at premiums, but it'll give you an inaccurate picture of the comparison between school districts or between any company. It's, it's a very complicated process to try to compare plan over plan. We, we, we have tried, and I can bring you some numbers, I'm just telling you, it's, it's not apples to apples. The coverage that we have is nothing like the coverage for Ferguson Florissant, and for us to compare Ferguson Florissant's premium to our premium doesn't answer the question that you might be asking. Well, they're not a benchmark district either, so I'd be uh, uh, more interested so Parkway in Parkway or Rockwood. Rockwood and the St. Charles County districts. I'd be interested, you know, do We have some self-funded districts. We have fully insured districts. And so I'm just curious, do all of the districts provide that base health care at no cost to the employee? And are any other districts contributing the 1000 and $2,000 to the deductible? I would say that it is pretty much universal that school districts provide coverage for individual only insurance. That is true. And districts that, part that, that have a consumer-driven plan, it's also pretty universal that some level of contribution to the uh, health savings account is a part of the incentive to be in the consumer-driven plan. We could, get, we could gather some information on which districts offer consum consumer-driven plans and, and what type of uh, contribution towards the health savings account they make. We, we could certainly compare that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Lots of uh, info to digest here um, and suggest any other questions get sent over. Um, I think we'll take a like a five minute recess and then uh, reconvene with our regular business meeting. Again, we either get skirts for the tables or we work against them. You're, you're doing good. Like, you, you kind of turned your legs. I was like, oh, that's a good idea. Well, she's trying to give one of those old people a heart attack. I didn't even. Yeah, I did not even. I mean, it didn't even cross my mind, Mary, to. We could have easily gotten it or even brought our tablecloths. Good now, but just be careful. You said, oh, no, unless you really are trying to give them a hard time. I would, I would just came up to tell her that. Okay, so just said, or else we should all work in the same place. Yeah, you have to be careful with those dresses. Do this I, I said I can't tell, but I just wanted to tell her. She's just, she just shared that with me to make sure I don't flash anybody. Right. I said, I'm doing my best.
With the time being 7.29 p.m., I'd like to call the Francis House School District Board of Education meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, tonight being led by our superintendent, Dr. Mary Hendricks Harris. a motion to approve the agenda as submitted. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Walker, second by Ms. Diglich. By roll call. Ms. Walker. Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Mm. Patron comments. During patron comments, patrons are invited to address the Board of Education. Please come to the podium so everyone can hear. Please adhere to the three minute time limit. The Board is interested in the public's concerns and opinions, but we do not answer patron, patron questions during the meeting. Questions and concerns will be addressed by Dr. Hendricks Harris and other appropriate staff members. Please remember that comments about individual students and staff are not allowed due to confidentiality. These concerns need to be brought to the administration's attention and may be brought to the board in closed session. Tracy Bono. Hi, um, thank you for letting me speak. I appreciate it very much. Um, try to stick to my three minutes. Um, I 
went to Francis Hall. I'm a graduate of the Francis Hall School District, and all three of my children, Francis Hall School District. My mother is a retired educator with the Francis Hall School District. Always been a fan. Um, so I'm really here about something that happened to my youngest child, who I had to pull from the Francis Hall School District. My, I have one that graduated and one that's still in the district, um, honor student at the high school. Um, my youngest child was at, went to um, the early childhood program, which we had a wonderful time with, and then he went to Warren Elementary. And the difference of my younger child versus my two older is my youngest child's special needs. Quite a different experience. Um, we had, that's on. We um, had a good first couple of years, then we got a new special education teacher. Um, who refused to follow his IEP, even though it's federally mandated, it's federal law, uh, refused to follow his behavior plan again, federal law, and uh, resorted to uh, having behaviors that were proven preventable based on his behavior plan, and we had documents to prove it, that it was preventable. Um, and he was uh, repeatedly locked in a small padded closet, the isolation room, that all of the elementary schools have in the Francis Health School District. Um, they also, you will not find the proper documentation on it because uh, the special education teacher told me she did not document it many times because she didn't technically close the door to the room, so she didn't technically have to document it. They held exercise mats up over the door and held them up with her body. She volunteered this information to me, so she didn't have to document it. Um, Documentation is not accurate. Documentation is um, not reliable. Um, he has suffers post-traumatic stress disorder. He sees a psychiatrist. We're kind of at a point now where he's not having the nightmares in the middle of the night waking him up anymore. Unfortunately, I discovered through this, I got connected with a lot of other families who also have children who've been traumatized by being locked in padded closets. Uh, at this, this school in Francis Hall School District. I would like to say I am pro-teacher, I am pro-student, I am pro-school district. I don't want anyone to get hurt, teacher or student. But I have to tell you, I worked with special needs uh, people. I have a master's degree and I'm an educator. Um, I have worked with special needs individuals. I've worked with adults over 200 pounds <laughs> with special needs. I understand behaviors and I not once ever had to lock someone in a closet, ever. I'm CPI trained, crisis prevention and intervention trained. It works well. If I locked my child in a closet at home, I'm sure I would get in trouble for that. It's not good. Um, I think uh, that, I don't know if you're familiar, but we have, we have a state legislation that's been proposed as well as federal legislation that's been proposed. The Thank you, your time is up. Thank you. FHEA, FISPA. Board, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented for June 6, 2019. So moved. Second. Motion by Mr. Hain. Second by Ms. Walker. By roll call. Mr. Lane. Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. removed from the consent agenda. Board, I'll entertain a motion to approve the donation from Pierre Desir as presented. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Walker, second by Mr. Hain. By roll call. Discussion. Oh, discussion, I'm sorry. So I am very excited that we're gonna have an opportunity to have a facility that's probably the best in the state. I do want to point out we have it raining inside of one of our high schools and so I just I'm a little bit uncomfortable that we are spending uh, we have this much being invested when we have it raining inside other high schools so while I am very grateful and excited I would ask that if students from the other buildings want to come work out 
I mean, is that something that's going to be possible for them to experience that same level of gym? I do think the weight room is going to be used constantly with France Health Central students, so I, I think there might be some uh, rare opportunities for students from other. I don't see that we would be able to open it up for regular use. Um, but I'd also to note that the previous equipment will be used at other schools, so this isn't just an advantage for France Health Central, but for some other schools. And we don't want our kids to get rained on, and we have a facilities group working on that master plan to ensure that we can make the proper accommodations at Francis Hall North. Board, any other discussion? By roll call? Ms. Stiglitz? Aye. 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 Motion carries 5 0. Board, I'll entertain a motion to approve the purchases over 7,500 as presented. Second. Motion made by Mr. Lane, second by Ms. Stiglitz. Any discussion? Seeing none by roll call. Mr. Hain. Aye. 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 Motion carries five to zero. Uh, budget review, first reading. Um, Mr. Supple. Thank you, Mr. Lang. Uh, the board had an opportunity at our last meeting to have a work session on the 2019-20 preliminary budget. Uh, there was a co uh, some questions from the board uh, in the intervening time, and I did put together some information that I, I hope the board will find helpful. Uh, I took the uh, actual uh, data from 2017-18 are how we ended that fiscal year, and I compared it to the preliminary budget for 2017 and 18. And so for both revenue and expense, I applied uh, factors to those categories uh, to show what we might expect uh, the 2019-20 budget, how, how it might end up if the uh, situations that were present in 17-18 would, uh, would, would uh, uh, appear again in 1920. Uh, I think it's a pretty fair representation that shows about a seven-tenths of one percent uh, improvement in our revenue picture overall and about a two percent reduction in our expenditures overall, so fairly small numbers from a percentage uh, basis, but fairly large numbers because we're talking about a large budget. And so if our revenue goes up by seven-tenths of a percent and our expenditures are two percent below what's budgeted, we would actually end the 1920 school year uh, with a balanced budget. So I know there was concern expressed about the level of deficit that's included in the preliminary budget. Uh, but this is a, a representation and certainly not a forecast or a promise of what the uh, final results of the year will be. But if we would follow trends that have been uh, present in prior years, and I think they're uh, fairly conservative, uh, uh, we would be able to uh, see most of that deficit, if not all of that deficit, uh, uh, go away as a result of the normal swing that we see in revenue and expense. And so I provided uh, that additional slide. It's attached to board docs. Uh, and you can, the, the green shaded column is simply a projection of fiscal year 20, uh, and the, the column in between the blue and the green is, is a preliminary budget as was presented uh, at our uh, work session uh, in May. Board, any discussion? I just have one question, uh, Mr. Supple. On uh, item number 33, the, uh, the purchase of the items that are in the, uh, the, the, the old church, um, I guess that's being proposed to purchase the fixtures, furniture, and equipment. Have we went through and seen kind of, is it going to be items that we can find useful? Yes. Yes, Dr. Vander, Dr. Vanderpool uh, went over and took a look at all of the items. and. Um, 
uh, has approved that, that these are all things that we're going to use. Okay, perfect. Yes. And there are some things that are being left uh, that we will make use of, uh, but the value of the items that we're choosing to keep and that we'll use on a regular basis exceeds the, the price that we're paying for everything else. So every, some things are kind of a bonus to us. That's what I was figuring. I just thought I'd ask. Board, any other questions? Okay, so I just want to make sure that I understand. The projected deficit is $5,261? Yes. Okay, just want to make sure I understand the numbers. And we have planned for $5 million to go into capital projects this year? Yes. Okay. So just based on the historical where our numbers fall, we're probably going to end up fairly close to a balanced budget. Yes. Thank you. And just so the board understands, the larger transfer has to do with a couple of items. Uh, one, maintaining an appropriate level of reserves in the capital fund. Uh, we just this week completed the purchase of a building that we're going to use for our, for our alternative learning program. And that came out of the reserves that we currently have in our capital fund. So there's a need to make sure that we replenish that so we maintain some reserve in that fund. And also we have some expenses related to the in-house operation of our transportation services. Also, uh, uh, those two things are contributing to that. So it's a little bit different than what we've seen in prior years. Just another question. Do you think we'll spend the $5 million in capital projects this year, or do you think we're just building the fund for that? No. Uh, as the uh, uh, capital budget is based on what we hope to accomplish. And reality is often that we can't get everything done that we'd like to get done within a particular fiscal year. You know, we have a fairly unique situation that our fiscal year ends June 30th, but our, our summer is June, July, and August. And so it typically crosses fiscal years, so we budget it this year, but we may pay only a portion of it in this fiscal year and a, a portion in next fiscal year. So the, the, the transfer amount that's budgeted there would be if we completed every project and got it paid prior to June 30th, which is unlikely to happen. Okay. But we've budgeted for those projects, and so we need to budget a reserve so that we don't show an ending negative fund balance in our capital fund. Got it. So let's say we put $3 million into capital projects this year just by nature of what we end up doing with it, and then the... Um, deficit comes in instead of being 5.2, 2.1. So we're basically going to be balanced at that point, correct? Yes. Thank you. Any other discussion? Superintendent comments. Dr. H.H. Uh, just a few things. First of all, the score is still 0-0. Zero, zero. Uh, in the 2018-19 school year, three Francis Hall School District students scored a perfect 36 on the ACT test. Laurel Ammon from Francis Hall Central, Ariana Chavez from Francis Hall North, and Sarah Steins from Francis Hall High School joined this very select group. Only one-tenth of one percent of almost two million students who take the ACT every year are able to achieve a perfect score. Congratulations also to France Hall High School sophomore Brooke Clemens. She became the first Francis Hall School District para-athlete to win a state championship. Brooke won the Misha State Championship in the shot put with a throw of nine feet two inches. She then followed up her state championship performance with a second place finish in the 100. Last week, members of the France Hall School District class of 2032, let that sit in for a minute, began their academic careers in kindergarten summer school success. Every elementary school in the district provides an opportunity for kindergarten students to make new friends and familiarize themselves with the new, their new school. This week, summer school begins in earnest. Between now and the end of July, we will have approximately 3,750 students participating in 12 different programs and camps in four different buildings. George Washington's Mount Vernon has selected Sager Middle School Social Studies teacher Matt Van Horn for a residential fellowship at the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington. Van Horn is one of five teachers selected for this opportunity to enhance their 18th century knowledge, explore different teaching techniques, and create educational resources that meet 21st century classroom needs. 
Um, you may or may not know that uh, competitive video gaming or esports is on the rise, uh, as is the number of college scholarships available. In total, the seniors of Francois Central's esports club have received $392,000 in scholarship offers this year. Specifically, senior Tanner Elliott is among the students receiving a combined total offer of $68,000 from, from seven different schools. Lastly, as we end the school year, I want to acknowledge all the hard work of our staff that made this a successful year. Many parents and student re students reported this was their best year yet. I did try to share some of the many complimentary emails I received as we closed out the school year, and I wish everyone a relaxing summer break. Thank you. Up next is Board of Education comments or request. I just want to know what game does he play that he got a $68,000 scholarship? I need to teach my kids that one. <laughs> Last Saturday, we had the opportunity to attend three graduations. Uh, for three different high schools. Everyone was very well done. The kids were very well behaved, and I want to thank the district for doing such a great job with our kids and making it such an enjoyable day. And I just want to add one other thing to that is um, this district does an awesome job with recognizing our veterans on Veterans Day and other holidays throughout the year, but I just want to make sure that everybody remembers this is the 75th anniversary of D-Day and with the awesome job that we do with other things, I just thought we should mention that. Thanks. So only thing I want to add is that the principals, they did a fantastic job on graduation day. That is a ton of work to organize that many people and all of the details. And it just, it was a great day. So I congratulate the principals and the staff that did work so hard to pull it off. They pulled it off well. And I think if I'm not mistaken, it was, uh, 1,388 graduates this year in Francis Howell, the district as a whole. All right, up next is uh, upcoming meetings. Uh, we have our board retreat June 18th at the Spencer Road Library, Community Commons, room 259, Spencer Road in St. Peter's. Anything else? next board meeting is what June 20th anything to change on that board I'll entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting second. motion by mr. Haynes second by mr. Lane by roll call Ms. Walker Aye. 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 Motion carries 5-0. Have a good evening.